Okay, so on Tuesday we finished up talking about alpha halogenation. We said that you can form an enol by treating a ketone or an aldehyde with acid or catalytic base. And then that enol that you form can react with elemental bromine. And we said if you keep on pushing this, you can actually get it to go more than once. And then we said, too, that things get tricky when you run into this situation where you have an unsymmetric uh, carbonyl, whether or not that's an aldehyde or a ketone. Well, I guess it would have to be a ketone. You typically go through the more substituted enol. So in this case, the enol on the left is more substituted, therefore more stable. So you tend to halogenate the more substituted position. We said you can do this exact same thing with basic conditions too. All right, oops, sorry, I've got my wrong notes up. So now let's take a look at a different type of reaction, but along the same lines. This is the reaction that was covered on the pod, but we didn't quite get to. So this is alpha bromination of carboxylic acids. All right, so the fancy name for this is the hell volhard zielinski reaction. <laughs> well, if you really want to impress another chemist, just throw out this name and they'll be like, oh, wow, this person knows what they're talking about. All right? So let's take a look at the mechanism. So in this mechanism, you're going to have some sort of carboxylic acid. Typically, it won't be very functionalized because the next reagent that we'll use is a pretty powerful reagent. It's PBr3. What do you think will happen to the starting material if you react it with PBr3? It'll brominate, right? So we saw previously that you can use PBr3 to convert alcohols to bromines. It'll actually do the same with carboxylic acids. So now we've got our acid bromide, which is really reactive. All right, in the next step, what you can do is treat this with catalytic acid. And we do have alpha protons right here, right? So we can actually tautomerize this all the way to the enol. So I won't show that complete tautomerization because we practiced that already earlier this week, but make sure that you are comfortable with all of the arrow pushing. The nice thing with this, though, is it leaves that bromine attached, so the bromine won't fall off at this step. And then in the next step, what you can do is react this with more bromine. And just like we saw before, this alpha position right here, is pretty nucleophilic in the enol state. So you can take these electrons down and then this pi bond can actually attack one of these bromines, kick off another bromine, and you get your alpha halogenation. All right, we still have a proton coming off of there. So we can show formation of our neutral product by just writing minus H plus. Get our bromine on there. And now we have this super duper reactive final product. All right, we actually have a few different options. What do you think will happen if I treat this with water? Yeah, we would convert it to a carboxylic acid. Water isn't powerful enough to do anything with that bromine right here, right? So we can't do SN1 or SN2 chemistry very easily with that green highlighted bromine. However, this bromine right here can readily do nucleophilic acyl substitution. So really, in this reaction, we can convert it back to a carboxylic acid, but leave that alpha bromine intact right there. All right, what if we wanted to get an ester? Yeah, we could have reacted this maybe with an alcohol. So instead of quenching with water, we could react this with some sort of alcohol. And if we were to do that, we can make an ester. There's a lot of different approaches you can take 
to get to this final product. But it's kind of nice because you can um, install an alpha uh, bromine uh, or an al uh, bromine alpha to some sort of carboxylic acid derivative, right? Yep. So you typically see this with the acid bromides. Um, I haven't really seen any equivalent one with uh, chlorines. And I'm assuming it's because you need the high reactivity of the acid bromide for this to work. Yeah, good question. All right, so this is related to the pod problem that I gave you the other day. I was basically asking you to propose a mechanism that looked like this, but now we've already done it, so don't worry about turning in pod 13. That's just gonna be for your own practice. All right, the next one that we're going to look at is actually related to the synthesis project that you're working on. This is called the halo form reaction. The good thing is this one's pretty intuitive. So most of the time students will see this and it just makes a lot of sense. So let's take this example. Since it's one you might be familiar with, right? <laughs> What's the starting material? Acetophenone. If you remember in class, or in lab I should say, you added in aqueous sodium hydroxide into your giant beaker. All right, so we know acid-base chemistry is faster than any other sort of chemistry that we know of. So what do you think will happen? It'll deprotonate one of these alpha protons, right? So we could show this attacking, stealing one of these protons, and making an enolate. It is important to remember, though, that this equilibrium is really not that favorable. However, we will get a little bit of our enolate to form. So it will definitely favor that starting material side. All right. Also, in solution, when you were working in lab, you were working with bleach. Bleach can be used for a variety of purposes, right? It can be used as a, an oxidant to maybe disinfect surfaces. It can also be used as a way of exposing something to a trace amount of elemental chlorine, too. So in lab, what you saw was a reaction with elemental chlorine. The reality is this X could have been chlorine, bromine, or iodine, so you can do this using any one of the normal halogens. Does that make sense? So in this next step, we've got a good nucleophile, and we can just alpha halogenate like we've seen already. Yep. This one, once we hit this step, it's going to be a one-way arrow, essentially. All right, so now we've alpha halogenated. We've got the X group on there now. However, if you did the math, you probably realize we used a huge excess of sodium hydroxide, right? So when you did that table in your notebook. So we will have excess hydroxide floating around, just like we had excess bleach. We can do this a few more times. So I'm just going to cheat and basically show this as times two. And we can get three halogens installed on that alpha position. Does that make sense? I know I'm kind of shortcutting this, but it's just that same step that we did up above two more times to get two more halogens off of that position. All right, so now we've got three halogens coming off that alpha position. We still have excess sodium hydroxide floating around in solution. However, it doesn't have any more alpha protons to attack into. What do you think it could do instead? Yeah, now it can attack the carbonyl, kick up electrons. And then if we think about this, normally we don't kick off carbon as a leaving group, but this is actually a pretty good leaving group. Anybody know why? Yeah, it's halogenated, right? Each one of these 
halogens is going to tug electron density away from that carbon through that dipole induction. Therefore, it's going to be a pretty good leaving group. And this bond that we have kind of floating in the middle here is quite weak due to that strong inductive pole. So now we can kick down these electrons and eject off this halogen, or this carbon, excuse me. So that leaving group now has that negative charge on the carbon. Do you think it's just going to stop here? Yeah, it's going to deprotonate. This carbon is not very happy with that negative charge, where carboxylic acid has a proton that can readily be do donated. And we get our carboxylate. Oops, and this should be HCX3. I did want to make a brief note on this, though. So if you make HCI3, oops, it will precipitate. So then the question is, well, why are you telling me about precipitation of a byproduct? Who cares? It's a byproduct. This actually used to be a test to determine whether or not you had a methyl ketone in solution. So if you didn't have a methyl ketone and you did this reaction, you wouldn't have a good leaving group to kick off, right? So let's say, sorry, I'm going to scroll back up. Let's say in the starting material right here, what if we didn't have this methyl group? What if it were an ethyl group? That last step, we wouldn't have a leaving group to kick off. It's that level of difference. So they use this for a long time as a qualitative test to determine whether or not you had a methyl ketone um, uh, as your unknown sample. Um, in fact, organic chemistry labs still across the United States will use this as a derivative test to check um, really quickly to narrow down a set of unknowns. Does that make sense? It really only works with uh, iodine, though. You don't get that with uh, chlorine. As you saw in lab, we didn't get any sort of precipitate there. All right, and then last but not least, what did you do in lab? You added HCl, right? And then it started foaming out of solution. So if you react this with HCl, the main purpose of that is to ensure that your final product ends up as a carboxylic acid. All right, just for fun, how could we go from our carboxylic acid back to our starting material? This could be a good quiz question or exam question. It's not going to be a one-step reaction. It'll be two steps. How can we change this into a good leaving group? We could use SOCl2, right? So we could turn that into a chlorine. And then how could we get the methyl group to go on? Could we use a Grignard reagent? No, that would add in twice. Yeah, we would have to use that copper one. So if we use the Gilman reagent, we could add that methyl group back in. So oftentimes in chemistry, we're trying to have a plan of attack so we can make one functional group or even do the reverse route if needed. So this is more just for practice. All right, does that make sense? So for your synthesis mechanism for your project, it's OK to show this step as just being Cl2. You don't need to show the NaO um, Cl um, or anything like that for the bleach. Just show this as Cl2. It's fine with me. All right, now we get to go into the fun stuff. Uh, alpha halogenation is cool. I would say the haloform reaction is definitely the most prevalent form of this um, because it's a useful way of converting a methyl ketone to a carboxylic acid. Yep. Yeah. All right, so the next section we're going to look at in this chapter is all about alpha carbon chemistry again, but we're going to be using it as a nucleophile. Um, and instead of the nucleophile attacking a halogen, we'll actually be attacking other electrophiles. So what's another electrophile that we've used 
previously and had nucleophiles attack into. What's that? Yeah, we could have a nucleophile attack into ketones and aldehydes, right? That was kind of what our previous chapters were about. So that's exactly what our next section is on. We're going to form an enolate and have it attack a ketone or an aldehyde. So let's go ahead and jump into this. And I will say this reaction is called an aldol reaction, and it usually uses an aldehyde. However, under certain circumstances, you can actually use a ketone. And what will happen, oops, let me squeeze this down, is we'll react this with sodium hydroxide. We know that this aldehyde has alpha protons that can be deprotonated, form an enolate. And we'll work through this mechanism, but I wanted to show you the final product. So this was the alpha position on our starting molecule, right? Over here we had this alpha carbon. And now we've extended this carbon chain to a beta position. So that's a good point. Where, where do you think we got those two new carbons? Starting, Starting material. It'll actually react itself. All right. And then in this reaction, we've made a new alpha-beta bond, right? So this is a cool carbon-carbon bond-forming reaction. And this is referred to as a beta-hydroxy aldehyde. So if you see a beta hydroxy aldehyde like this, there's a fair chance it came from an aldol reaction, which is kind of neat. All right, so now let's take a look at the mechanism and see if we can figure out how we got from our starting material to our final product. All right, so we started out with this aldehyde. We've got three alpha protons coming off, so I'm going to show all of those. And we know we've got sodium hydroxide floating around. And we know that this is not going to be a one-way arrow, just like it wasn't with the halo form reaction. So I'll show this with equilibrium arrows. And just like with the halo form reaction, we're going to snag one of these alpha protons and make an enolate. I'm going to kind of neglect the other two alpha protons because we know they're there, but we don't have to draw them. And then, this may find other unreacted starting material. So I'm going to make a note of that. This is unenolized starting material, right? Because we know this equilibrium isn't going to produce very much of our enolate. Only a small portion of our starting material will form our enolate the rest of it will remain as unenolized starting material. Does that make sense? It's kind of confusing to think about this occurring in equilibrium. All right, now if we think about it, this carbon with the negative charge on an enolate is a good nucleophile. Somebody said we can react a good nucleophile with aldehydes and ketones. So this can attack in and kick up electrons. All right, so if you're kind of keeping track of everything, this hydrogen right here. All right, well, <laughs> when life throws you lemons, we just keep on writing. So we got to the point. It's okay, I'll copy notes over later from last year, so you'll have all of this in one note. So we just made this intermediate, right? So this is the intermediate that we just made. We know that our conjugate acid in solution is water. So water could be our proton source to protonate this alkoxide. All 
That's weird. I've never had that happen before where my notes just disappeared. Really? I wonder if that's a glitch in their update. All right, so now we've created our beta hydroxy aldehyde, and we've also generated our hydroxide. One important note with this reaction is I've been using equilibrium arrows the entire way, right? So the note is that this reaction is reversible. With aldehydes, you tend to get more of this beta hydroxy aldehyde. Does anybody know why? Yeah, aldehydes are a lot more electrophilic than ketones, right? Ketones aren't the greatest electrophiles, so they tend to favor the starting material, not the beta hydroxy product, where with aldehydes, you do get an appreciable amount of your beta hydroxy product. But it is important to remember that it's reversible. If you remember, I think we talked about this briefly, what do we call a reaction when we do it in reverse? There's a prefix that we throw in. We don't call it an aldol or a reverse aldol. It's a retro aldol. So if you ever hear the term retro aldol, um, you can actually do this reaction completely in reverse. So retro aldol is the reverse. Yep. Right, so if we're trying to go in reverse, it's essentially the same thing where we could grab this proton and do that, right? So just follow your arrow pushing all the way backwards. It is kind of weird. A lot of times students are like, well, why are you showing us a reaction that's reversible? Um, however, it is important to keep it in mind that aldehydes form a significant amount of this. Ketones don't. It does depend on the situation that you're running into. So it's hard to um, say that this works 100% of the time. Um, but it will work pretty well for most aldehydes. All right, so now let's do some practice. All right, so for this practice, we're going to start out with this aldehyde. And we're going to react this with sodium hydroxide and water. And what I want you to do is to see if you can predict what the product will look like. <laughs> grab one of these alpha protons, right? In this case, we've got alpha protons right here. So if you have alpha protons around, we know fastest reaction will always be that acid-base chemistry. So we're going to form our enol, or sorry, our enolate. All right, now what? Yeah, it'll react again with another equivalent of starting material. And in fact, I'm going to change the color on this to blue. And you'll see why later. Sometimes it helps to look at your final product and be able to tell where every atom came from. All right, so this will react with some unenolized starting material. Pick up electrons. All right, and I'm going to draw our new bond that we're forming in orange over here. And then we've got our oxygen, got our hydrogen. Does that make sense? Is that what everyone's getting? So I like showing things color-coded. That way I can kind of keep track of where things came from. So if you're keeping track this way, you can tell that that orange bond is the new carbon-carbon bond that was formed. And then we also had water floating around. That's our conjugate acid. So we can protonate this.
and I'm gonna simplify this and not draw the hydrogen anymore. And there we go, we've made our final product and we know we'll regenerate our hydroxide in solution. Does that make sense? So this would be our final product that would go in that box. Yeah. So is your question, will this continue to react at that point? Yeah, so we do have an alpha proton still remaining there. We could deprotonate that and make an enolate. However, is it going to be a very good nucleophile at this point? It's really crowded at that point, so it tends to stop after one addition. But great question. In, in general, it'll always stop after one addition. It tends not to go beyond one addition. Good question. So if we're keeping track of everything here, right, this is still our original alpha position. Now we've got this new beta position off of here. And we said we always run into this situation where we form our beta hydroxy group. All right, now I'm going to throw a harder challenge at you. All right. <laughs> this time... So I'm going to cross this off here. I want you to predict the starting material. <laughs> All right. Like, what is this squiggly monster that you're drawing, Jeff? Stop it. I like that you ask everybody in the front row to duck down rather than me to scroll up. <laughs> Makes my life easier. Let's try not to do the mechanism, though. Let's try to predict. So no mechanisms this time. Let's conceptualize. So do you notice how in my product, in that top left-hand corner, I indicated my alpha and beta positions? Let's do the same thing here. Indicate what was alpha and what was beta. Or what is alpha and what is beta? All right, once you think you've got the alpha and beta positions labeled, check with your neighbor. All right, give me a thumbs up if you think you got them. All right, so alpha position is always going to be the position next to your aldehyde, right? Which means that our beta group is always going to be the position with the alcohol. Okay, so where was the bond formed? between alpha and beta. So just like I did before, I'm going to highlight that as orange, and I'm going to say that this is our new bond. All right, which means that down here, this must have been a separate molecule. So in fact, I'm going to label this as a different color. So I'll label that kind of as blue. Can you see that? It's a little hard to see. I guess blue and black is not the best contrast. All right. So if we look at this position right here, what do you think that CO bond used to be? It used to be a CO double bond. Okay, so without doing the mechanism, we can kind of predict, right? So the first molecule in black kind of looks like that, right? And then the blue molecule down here We said looks like that. There's also a hydrogen coming off. So what do you notice about both of these? The They're the same. So normally with aldols, we don't try to mix them. Otherwise, you run into this crazy complicated mixture. However, if you have one aldehyde, it'll react with itself and tend to lead to one major product. Does that make sense? So understanding these pattern recognitions can help out a lot. However, if you're ever, ever stuck, best approach is just draw the mechanism, right? All right, so one more before we leave today. We're going to jump into something called the aldol condensation. All right. So let's take the previous example that we started out with at the very beginning. We said 
with sodium hydroxide and water that we could form this beta hydroxy aldehyde. So that's kind of where we've been working on. Crazy thing with this is if you heat this reaction up, so I'm using that delta symbol for heat, you can actually push this out of equilibrium all the way here. So we said that this was a beta hydroxy aldehyde. And you can also make beta hydroxy ketones as well, right? Just in this example, we started with an aldehyde. What would we call this group? So we've got alpha, beta here, alpha. So we don't call it an alkene. What do we call it, though, if things are in alkanes? <laughs> we typically refer to them as unsaturated, right? So this would be an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde. Exactly, like an unsaturated fat. So saturated means it's an alkane. Unsaturated means it's an alkene or an alkyne. In this case, we're stopping at the alkene, though. All right, so let's try to make sense of this mechanism. All right, so let's just kind of rehash everything we've been practicing. So we said very, very first step. Sorry, I'm going to scroll up. Would be to form our enolate, and we said that these steps will be in equilibrium, and we tend not to do mixed aldols because we get a ton of products, we'll talk more about that later, but it'll react with unreacted starting material, And we said that our conjugate acid that's floating around, water, can be our proton source. So this is really just review of what we've been practicing all day. However, we've kicked off hydroxide too, right? All right, so now the question is, well, what will happen next? This is going to make a lot of you angry. But we have additional alpha protons, right? So what happens next, based on the product that we're observing, it's thought that we grab one of these alpha protons, kick this off, and kick off hydroxide. No, it does not need to be that hot. It doesn't take that much. So this is the thing that most organic chemistry students look at, and they're like, you told me all year long that alcohols are bad leaving groups, and now you're showing this as a leaving group, and I don't trust you anymore. So the question is, well, why would this happen? Does anybody have an answer for why this might happen? So, so there's heat. Heat can solve a lot of problems, right? But what does heat do in terms of a reaction? Let's think about Gibbs free energy. What does heat really impact? Entropy, right? So heat impacts entropy. In this case, if you notice, we're making two moles of our product, right? So more moles of product. Well, if you think about it, right, our hydroxide was catalytic during this whole mechanism. Our hydroxide that we kicked off here is still around, so that's catalytic. The hydroxide we put in also comes out. But we made two moles of our products. So we could say entropy is favored 
at high temp. All right, anything else that people notice about this? <laughs> I think this is pretty cool. So we've not only made a carbon-carbon bond, but we'll actually be able to react the beta position later and use that as an electrophile. No, you cannot <laughs> use it. This is the only exception to alcohols being bad leaving groups. But what if we do make more All right, what else do you notice about our final product here? It's more conjugated. You notice we went from an unconjugated system to a conjugated system, right? So So I did make an error. Instead of being equilibrium arrows, this final arrow is one way. Because we form something that's so stable, it essentially becomes non-reversible. That hydroxide won't attack in and reform your beta hydroxyaldehyde. Does that make sense? I know it's a bit complicated. So your pod that's due on Monday, I want you to practice um, going over these mechanisms, but see if you can do it without your notes. Try to use your orgo instinct.